Your oils are pleasing. Your fragrance is beautiful. You are beautiful, Lord. We long to see your beauty. We long to inhabit and for you to inhabit us with, and for us to capture a revelation of your beauty. And we say, Lord, to you, we ask you, draw us to you, Lord. Draw us to you in oneness in intimacy and let us run together put that seal of love on our hearts Lord put that seal of love on our hearts that many waters cannot quench we long for you Lord we long for a deeper intimacy a, a, a greater love a greater passion a greater understanding of your, of your love and your desire for us. We seek you with all of our hearts. And you say, if we seek you, we shall find you. And we say, we do. We do. We do. We seek you. And we do say, and we, want, we ask for a deeper understanding and revelation of this, so that the Spirit and the Bride may say, Come, out of love, out of, out of unity, uh, in oneness with the Spirit. And so we say, Lord, do your work in us. And do your work through us. In the name of Jesus, amen, 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 amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Drew. That was really, really powerful. Amen, amen. All right, well, welcome again. Glad that everybody is uh, here today and hope you had a restful, enjoyable afternoon and are, are refreshed and ready for another session. So uh, I'm going to just call Terry to come on up here. And when he gets a chance, here, we're just sending to see. Get ready there. All right. That's good. Amen. Thank you, brother. Good evening. Good to be together again. Very enjoyable day. Uh, so enjoy hearing the Lord come through others, including my son Josiah. But you as well. That's a joy for me just to to uh, live, be able to listen and receive and hear the Lord and as he is uh, being proclaimed. And the Holy Spirit is working and bringing what is being said uh, to a beginning reality. I appreciate the Lord in that work, don't you guys? I just want to continue. So uh, <clears throat> we're going to continue, by the way, tonight <laughs> in looking at... Uh, some verses. I so appreciate Drew. Uh, you know, it's happened so many times with your brother, but just some of the things, the the songs that uh, I, I think, did you write those songs? No. Well, the ones that the Lord leads you to choose, let's say it that way, just uh, their meaning. So um, as to what I'm going to share, and so I'm going to look tonight and uh, uh, firstly at a couple of passages. I, I quoted them. Um, out of Second Chronicles 16, but I want to read it um, tonight and then jump to a different passage that correlates a little bit to it. So Second Chronicles 16, familiar, but I want to verse, go to verse 8. I'm not going to take the entire context of it, but just pointing to this um, uh, passage. <clears throat> He says in uh, the latter part of verse 8, he said, When you depended on the Lord, he handed them over to you. Talking about, looking earlier in the verse, the Cushites, the Libyans, the chariots, the horsemen. That when they depended on the Lord, the Lord handed them over to them. For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong uh, for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. And that's quite the beautiful passage, isn't it? You have been foolish in this matter. Therefore, you will have wars from now on. And then in Zechariah, um, 
chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but you can. Zechariah chapter 4, I just want to read a little portion uh, out of uh, Zechariah 4. It's, it's a few verses, but not too many, hopefully. So verses 6 through 14 of Zechariah 4. If I can one-handedly get over there. Problem is, I got a bone in my finger. Don't y'all? <laughs> Zechariah chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 6 through 14. Uh, so he answered me This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by strength or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. What are you, great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. And he will bring out the capstone accompanied by shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Zerubbabel's hands have laid the foundation of this house. And his hands will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of armies has sent me to you. For who despises the day of small things? These seven eyes of the Lord, which scan throughout the whole earth, isn't that interesting? Will rejoice. That's interesting, isn't it, Jeff? Will rejoice when they see the ceremonial stone in Zerubbabel's hands. I just want to point out again the this passage, the specifically seven eyes of the Lord. I was talking somewhat about the seven spirits of God this morning. The seven eyes of the Lord scan throughout the whole earth and rejoice. They see that which is the divine will of God, really, is what's being said. When God's plan, God's purpose, God's thought in God's people is being realized, there's rejoicing. I... Uh, I want to be a part of that which brings joy, which God eternally has, but brings joy to God specifically because there's vessels, a vessel, corporately I'm talking about, that is with him, not at odds with him, but in alignment, divine alignment with him. Don't you? you know, uh, whatever message is being shared, the key to anything being shared if it is the oracles of God, it is for my heart, our hearts, to allow God to make real inwardly, outwardly, what is being said individually and corporately, don't you think? That's God's work. He is committed to us in that work. I simply want to be equally, by his spirit, committed to him and that inward work, and the corporate work. How about you? So we're going to, uh, keeping in mind um, the, both the Second Peter 3 and the First Peter 3 passage, uh, and I maybe should just remind us by reading those again, uh, they're worth reading again, don't you think? As are all the scriptures, but uh, so I will. I'll just simply read Again, a little bit out of First Peter 3, and then we'll go back to Genesis. So First Peter chapter 3, again, just uh, <clears throat> reading a portion of this in order to get to some of what I was sharing uh, last night. For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, right? And uh, I'm going to read this out of a better version, and that being... <laughs> the Lavender New Testament. It is somewhat better here. Uh, for Christ also suffered once and for all concerning sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but having been made alive by the Spirit, by whom also having gone, he preached to the spirits in prison, the ones, defining them, having formally disobeyed while the patience of God used to keep waiting in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which few, that is eight souls, were safely delivered 
through water. Which antitype now also saves us, that is baptism. Remember, I said this last night, um, it is the waters that would destroy the flesh, all flesh has come up before me. God was greed that he had ever made man. And the water that would destroy them was the water that brought deliverance to Noah and his family. And again, the uh, nation of Israel exiting, exiting from Egypt, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they would pass through the Red Sea unto their deliverance, but unto the destruction of the Egyptians. See the pattern? They pass through unto what? Unto resurrection ground, unto a new life, a new beginning. Is that not true? When Noah exited the ark, there's a whole new beginning on the world. When Israel came through that Red Sea, their enemies were destroyed. They had a whole new beginning in front of them. They were no longer to be slaves. I hope we can see the significance then of not only baptism, but let me say this to us now. There's water, and that's right in keeping in view, but any baptism of fire that we're going to go through, are going through, and are going to go through, corporately, individually speaking, is meant to be under our, our, unto our refinement and our salvation, our deliverance. Though for the rest of the world, it'll be destroyed by fire. That's what's in God's heart. Amen? So uh, I want to keep in view that God aims to bring us, according to the covenant of Christ, into that good land, Christ himself, of which he's promised us, promised us in a full measuredness of relationship, inwardly and outwardly speaking. So we're saying yes to not... Uh, standing on any other ground but coming on to the ground of life versus death, right? Resurrection versus the grave. Truth versus the lie. Light versus darkness. We're saying yes to the newness of life that is Christ, ever increasing within the people of God. So we're going to look then, uh, I won't read all of Second Peter uh, chapter 3, but again, I, won't, I love that verse, verses 1 and 2. Beloved, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you in which I stir up your sincere mind by a reminder to remember the ramas. I love that way it's written, Drew. Kind of does it for me, brother. <laughs> May the Lord give you a song about the ramas. <laughs> I, I really mean that. May you do it. If he hadn't already, has he already done that? May you do it having been spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of your apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that in the last of the day, scoffers will come. I'll stop there. Remember the ramus. So we're going to go back to Genesis now and look a little deeper into the days of Noah. My intent is not just, and, and this is a part of the dynamic, but not just to look at um, principles of what was happening in the times of Noah, though there's uh, can be value to that. Um, it's to uh, to become like Noah, right? Ready. That's the real intent, isn't it? To be a vessel made ready as Noah was made ready. Despite what was going on around him. You're right. The environment around Noah was hideous, to say the least. Nevertheless, God was readying him and his family in the midst of that environment. 
So let's go back now to Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to specifically focus in upon something that, again, I, I want us simply to see what God is after. It's, it's sad, you know, Alan and Jim, we have to come to the negative in Genesis in this. But we're going to be focused on the positive. What do you think about that, Janet? <laughs> the negative will lead us to the positive, right? To what the Lord wants. That's really my intent. I just don't want to talk about the negative to talk about the negative. The negative is here and its results, a warning. But for us, spurring us on to the positive, to what God wants. Anyway, anyway, I believe that's God's intent. It is certainly my intent. So as we look at Genesis 3, we're going to see God's response. Keep this in mind as we read these passages. I talked about four steps last night to destruction, but we flipped that around to four steps for us to readiness. What to avoid. Right? What do you think? What do you think, Matt? We're going to focus right on the positive. There's the negative, and I'm going to get to the Lord and let the Lord be in me what he wants to be, which is the exact opposite of those four steps to wrath. Don't you think? So tonight, we're going to look at the negative, how God responds to lost distinctiveness in his own people. With the intent, though, that we be a people of distinctiveness set apart unto the Lord and remain there in a growing way. Just trying to clarify. So it was all sounds so negative. But for us, uh, we're the ones that are going to pass through the waters, are going to pass through the fire, be refined, and come into a place in the Lord that we've never been in before. And that is God's intent. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hello? <laughs> I think that's something worthy about everything. Praise him over that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Your intent is beautiful unto your people. And he's inviting everybody. It's a choice. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 <clears throat> We'll look at. So last night we talked a little bit about verse 7. The eyes of both of them were open and all the consequences that that led to because now they knew evil by experience. But in Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 22, uh, and the Lord God said, Since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. So there's an overriding theme in that verse right there. That's called God will not tolerate mixture. You cannot have both. Amen? Uh, if you're neither cold nor hot, they will say in the book of Revelation, God will throw you up. <laughs> I like the well threw Jonah up. Why do I find humor in that? I just do. Sorry. It's a sad, sick form of humor I have. <laughs> so that's a part of a principle here, but it's about life and death because there's a law to life. And part of the law of life is that's in Christ is no mixture. God will not tolerate it. So God acts because of the mixture, brings consequences because of the mixture. What are the consequences? So the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out. Now that's a consequence. Again, there's the negative. Our objective is to not be driven out. God's will is not to drive us out. God's will is for us to come near in Christ, to be united in Christ into one people, one body, the body of Christ. So that's what we're 
looking at inwardly, though outwardly as we're looking at this, we're thinking, wow. So this lost distinctiveness, they were set apart to God, made by him. They were to be his. Everything of the future of man, had they not fallen, would have been completely other than this. There would have never, listen, there would have never been a flood. That would have never been the law. That could have happened had the sons of God not fallen. That would have never been the law. There would been no need for the law. Right? Book of Galatians, the law was introduced because of sin. It was not foreordained. It was necessary to restrain sin, to make sin known to be sin. Now that's after the fall. The law didn't need to be. The flood didn't need to be. If we could have had obedience somewhere in all of this, besides one man, the ones and the twos, right? If it could have been the sons of God, plural, Sons of God represents a godly line, a line that is with God. The daughters of men represents a line that has lost that distinctiveness, and there God is making a distinction. There is his people, and then there are those who are not. And that's what we see going on here in Genesis. Is that not true now? Is it not meant to be true now? Is there not meant to be a distinctiveness to the believer and to the believer's plural? Are we going to argue with the Bible that it doesn't matter. It matters, and that's what I want us to see the fact of the consequences for thinking it doesn't matter, but more importantly, that we come into the reality of what God wants. The consequence for the man and the woman is they are driven out. That's a stunning consequence. You know that, guys? I don't want to ever hear that from the Lord. Get out. Get away from me. This place I prepared for you, you cannot live here. Get out. Is that too strong? Just wait. <laughs> Introduce stupid humor to make things lighter. <laughs> so uh, it is... Uh, Sobering, is it not? That's what's going on here. God drives the man out of where God placed the man. Let's see it clearly. God had placed the man. It says this, as you read in Genesis. God placed them in a garden, and now God drives them out of that garden, Scott. Isn't that something? I don't want that to ever be the case. I do not want, hear me. I do not want to be driven out of Christ. You say, that's impossible. I beg to differ because of a loss of distinctiveness. So God drove the man out. And not only that, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming, whirling, sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. Fellowship, the former fellowship between God and man was broken. God drove them out. That's what happens when there is a loss of distinctiveness to that which belongs to God is in on his line of resurrection and life, but instead chooses death, chooses independent life, self-life, independent way, independent truth, and God says, get out. What I prepared for you, you cannot live in any longer. I uh, believe that's a grieving heart of God. I don't believe that's just some wrathful heart of God, though that could be true as well, but there's a grieving of God that takes place, and it's taking place now in the church. Mixture has become a primary condition of the modern church. 
Well, let's go on. Genesis chapter 4. The days of Noah. I hope we are seeing more clearly. I hope this, <laughs> if not helpful, is sobering. <laughs> So here we're dealing with Cain again. Genesis chapter 4, beginning with verse number 10 here. Then he said, what have you done? Anybody ever heard God say that to them? Are you glad I am that he hasn't? I don't want him to ever say it. What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Notice that. Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed, alienated from that ground. The ground is crying out because of his brother's blood. And God says very clearly to him, you can no longer stay on this ground. You will have to leave. God still do that today? Well, of course he does. God hasn't changed. Everybody else must, but God doesn't. You're cursed, alienated from the ground that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood you have shed. If you work the ground, it will never again give you its yield, its full measuredness. You will be a restless wanderer in the earth. There's the pronouncement of God upon Cain's sin. He was to be a restless wanderer in the earth. So let's look at this further. Cain answered the Lord, my punishment is too great for, to bear since you are, listen to this, banishing me today from the face of the earth. So we saw Adam and Eve put out. Now we're seeing Cain put out. That's the days of Noah. Noah would know about these events. And later, as we get into the latter parts of this, he would have witnessed them. Not yet, but as we go later on in this. Since you are banishing me today from the face of the earth, and I must bide or hide, excuse me, I must hide from your presence. Didn't we enjoy the presence of the Lord among us tonight? Wasn't that beautiful? What if we ne were never allowed to enjoy just what we experienced a few moments ago? Ever again. That would be a judgment, don't you think, Drew? How wonderful it is to enjoy the Lord within. How wonderful it is to enjoy, enjoy the Lord corporately, the presence of the Lord. I don't take that lightly to y'all. It's beautiful. I think Drew and the rest of the, the, the guys and ladies, it's lady that was up here for allowing the Lord, as they do and did, come forth. In this message, I want to allow the Lord to do what only he can do in me and you. We're looking for an increase of the presence of Christ as life within us, are we not? It's not a minor thing for the Lord to be in us and the Lord to be among us. That is a precious thing. Cain is told by God, I just want to say that before, the devastating blow of what God says to Cain. Cain recognizes the full impact of this. I'm being banished from the face of the earth, this ground that I was living in. I must hide from your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. Now he jumped to that. That's fear operating in Cain. It's not maybe too far off. Then the Lord replied to him, in that case, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. See, so I read this uh, last night. Lamech, of course, from the line, however, of Cain, 
not the line of Seth, the godly line. Two lines operating. God's clearly identifying them in the book of Genesis. There is that line of people who are in the good of God, and there's a line of, that, of people who are banished. And Genesis identifies them very clearly. It can be no mistaking it once your eyes are open to see it. God is identifying something. These are a people of distinctiveness. They are mine. And these are a people of no distinctiveness. They belong to themselves and are an open door to the devil. And it's that line of undistinctiveness is going to fill the earth. They always do. With themselves. Their own kind. Is this too heavy? Feel free to pass out anything you want to and throw at me if you got no one. I'll try to dodge. <laughs> so, Lamech takes this statement and says, okay, it's said of Cain, whoever, uh, you know, the vengeance will be seven times over. And he says, but Lamech's way beyond that, right? 77 times. That's the progression of evil. Right, Drew? Starts back here, smaller. But as time goes by, like, ain't that true, Randall? Time goes by, seven becomes 77 under Lamech. That is the spirit of murder that has opened up in this. I remember uh, going into hell in 1996. What a story I'm about to tell. And I'd been there for several days um, in the human realm. It was my first time to ever be there. I met specific people, Napoleon Bonaparte, John Lennon, uh, Adolf Hitler, others. Uh, interacted with them while they were in torment. But after uh, that, those experiences, there were a number of them. Um, there was one angel with me the entire time. Four more came to me, so I now had five angels with me. And this massive whatever door type thing opened up into this abyss area. And uh, what had been darkness and heat but no light in the human realm, I entered a realm where there are no humans. Only demonic spirits from the past who have been judged or are being judged now most aren't, but some are. So the angels were around me in a protective way, light coming off of them, honestly, so I could see anything. I wouldn't have been able to see anything. We descended into the abyss to this creature. And I would see 10 of them, but I'm going to go to this first one, first creature I saw, who was animalistic in its behavior. I could not believe that this had been a former uh, angel of God. Is set that way because of the way it was acting. It was, this was never the case with the humans in the human realm. I was, by the Lord's power, able to discern and read things of the people. But this being was completely resistant to me. Did not want me to know anything about it, about itself. So the angels surrounded it and hit it with full measured light, which was like an x-ray machine. And it went even more animalistic, ballistically so. And starts bragging to me. And here was its boast and its brag. I ordered the first murder, it said, when Cain slew Abel. I came to find out that there was, uh, these were 10 of the top generals underneath Satan that are now in judgment. He has replaced them, though they knew they would be re-released in the future. Said so, no uncertain terms to me. They know it. They may know the Bible better than we do when the abyss is open and out comes. You can read it.
an open door to the demonic realm because of a loss of distinctiveness. Is that what the church wants? Is that playing hardball? There are consequences to our choices, are there not? Putting it together, there are consequences to choosing an independent life rather than as Eve and Adam did, rather than dependency upon God. An independent life from God's way, an independent life from God's life, an independent life from God's truth found in the person of Christ. There are consequences to our independent life and way and actions. Dire, eternal consequences if we don't get to the sun. There are consequences to Cain's refusal, though he believed that God only was to be worshipped. His refusal to obey God's pattern in Christ and instead offer the best of himself that he could produce rather than depend upon the Lord. There are consequences to those actions, right? So it's there that Cain is banished, he says. So he placed a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. Then Cain went out from the Lord's presence. Listen to this. I just want to say it this way. The, Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived. How did he live? Outside the Lord's presence. He lived for himself. Then continuing on, Cain was intimate with his wife. Now I want you to couple this verse 17 and for a moment look over to verse 25. Adam was intimate with his wife. But the one line is producing something completely other than what the godly line is going to produce. See the two lines? Hello? I got to ask you a question. Do you see the two lines that are being presented in the book of Genesis? The godly line and the ungodly line. So Cain was intimate with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Why would Satan, and he does it all the time, don't you think, Drew? He mimics for deception purposes by name. There's an Enoch who's going to walk with God, but not this one in this line. The Enoch in this ungodly line is anything but like Enoch who walked with God and was not because God took him. See how God drinks the the distinction between the two lines? These belong to him, these do not, by choice. And then Cain became the wonder, builds a city, and names the city after his son Enoch. There's never been a city built before. This is the first, the city of Enoch. But not the Enoch of the godly line, the Enoch of the ungodly line. And not only that, as we could read, and I read some of it today, Cain thus begins to fill the earth. And please hear what I'm about to say. They, because of their disobedience, are not in step with the Spirit. They are out of time with the purpose of God and the way of God and the will of God. In other words, you guys know this about, each of us know this about ourselves. There are things of the Lord that he has, but first demand him doing a work in us before he can give and use us in those things. We recognize that, right? Is that not true? You recognize that? God in his love is shepherding us in that way. Thank God. I praise him for it. But not this line. They're going to get into metal work, iron. They're going to get into things that are out so far out of the timing of God. I have no doubt that the godly line itself would have come to a city, but it would have been recognized that yet they would have been looking as Abraham for a city whose builder and maker is God. 
There's a godly lying man versus the ungodly around him in the world. Is that not true? God wants them to understand that he is building us into a city. Not just building a city. Cain's going to build a city. What's wrong with that? God has something better. What's wrong with metal? Nothing but an evil lion is going to kill each other with it. An evil lion is going to take musical instruments and it's not going to be worship of God going on. It's going to be worship of self and demons going on. And that's exactly what happens. It's out of step with the spirit, out of time with the spirit of God. Maybe I said too much about it. I could go on. <laughs> it is a warning of God. God showing it to us in clarity, like right, Brian? Clearly, I want God wants us to see what an ungodly line of people produce. There's no good, there's no God in it. It's going to come to destruction. And God is going to see to it. Amen? So there's this. Cain was intimate with his wife. Well, here in verse 25, and Adam was intimate with his wife again. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has given me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. And notice, so Cain builds a city. A son was born to Seth also, and he named him Enosh. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, which is better, a city or calling on the name of the Lord? I hope the church of Jesus Christ appreciates what God appreciates. He'd rather have a people who are after him than any outward thing. Don't you think? We humans are builders, but if we're not careful... It'll be us building instead of the Lord. Don't you think? So that's Genesis 4 coming into play. Uh, Cain being banished. He's meant to be a wanderer. He refuses again that destiny. And he chooses to be a builder instead. Oh, please hear my heart. Please, oh, the things we can do for God. But it's us doing it. And it will burn in the fire when we stand in front of him. And I don't care what the results were. It does not matter. Well, take a deep breath. I have seen it. I'm not talking, I can say it, show it to you in the scriptures, but I have seen it. I've gone there and watched it and wept uncontrollably because I'm still me. And there before the Lord, I'm talking about specifically a minister. I've seen it with several people, including people I knew who are now with the Lord. Nothing they did, because they had done it, and nothing they did escaped the fire. What God doesn't initiate, he doesn't appreciate, and it will never stand before him. No flesh will glory in his sight. Well, it sure is quiet in here. <laughs> the days of Noah still live all around us. And I'm afraid mixed in the body of Christ now. That's God's point. That's why I'm saying it. Genesis lays it out, I believe, very, very clearly. God wants a distinction. Discriminating dynamic of life must be in place. These belong to the Lord. And all that that should mean, right? The full potential of that being realized. They do only that which Christ is speaking. They speak only that. And they do only that which they see Christ doing. That's what Christ did with his Father. And we must be in that relationship with Christ so that what Christ says, we speak. 
There's the oracles of God. What Christ is doing, and we see it, we do that. And we are under the hand of God in a discriminating way and in a distinct way, belonging to him. And we live in that reality of being his. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we choose to glorify God in our bodies. We must, I believe, redefine what it means to be the godly line again because we are in a day of great mixture in the house of God. And it's mixture in everything from teachings and preachings, doctrines and books and everything imaginable. All kinds of voices speaking. And I'm afraid that the voice of Christ that we need to be listening to and speaking what he speaks has been thrown to the dust. And we now know how to do Christianity. We know how to build it and we know how to sustain it. I think it got quieter, Janet. I don't know. <laughs> when I do those things, I'm just messing around. It's an ice breaker or a silence breaker or whatever, a cruel joke. <laughs> God, in our time, we just got to jump to the positive because there's a bit of a weightiness to seeing the condition that we are now in. As it was in the days of Noah, well, here we are. It's a little weighty, isn't it? It is with me. I know it's got to be for you guys as well. It's sad beyond sad. Grieving God and us. These things ought not to be. If ever there's been a need in this world for the testimony of the Lord in perfect clarity, when it's all said and done, there's a river flowing through the city of God that is, here's no mixture, as clear as crystal. You won't find mixture there. Yeah. Is that not right? There's a pure, clear testimony of the Lord. It is not mixed. There should be a pure, clear testimony of Jesus in the house of God. I'm talking about us as a people. Not only when we're together, thank God we can be together, but out there, a pure, clear testimony of Christ, the house of God, his people, out there, as well as when we're together, when there's no doubt that they belong to the Lord. They are of that godly line. That's not because we act quirky. <laughs> Can I tell you a story? I will leave a part out to protect the innocent. <laughs> so I was in Massachusetts ministering, and I won't tell you where. That's a populated state, so. In Massachusetts, in ministering, and uh, you know the Lord's funny, right? He's got a good sense of humor, so the Lord speaks to me, and He says, "This church is filled with a bunch of jerks." <laughs> I just listened, you know. So uh, I wasn't actually ministering that night. I was uh, with another brother who was going to minister, and so uh, he got up and started ministering. And they started manifesting, jerking. You know, it's just all this stuff going on. I'm watching it. <laughs> I told the other brother what the Lord said. He said, I wouldn't say that publicly if I was you, Terry. I said, I'm not about to. I'm just warning you. <laughs> so this is a nice breaker joke because this is such a sobering message. Let's introduce a little humor. So they were just jerking and carrying on just all over the place. Not everybody, just 95% of them. <laughs> and 95% of their body was jerky. <laughs> Two 95s. <laughs> and so uh, after it was all over, the other brother said to me, he said, you know, the Lord was right. They are a bunch of jerks. <laughs> anyway, such is the humor. True story, it's just humorous to me. I don't really think about it that much. I'm just trying to think of something I could introduce and tell some kind of a funny statement while this is so, so sobering. So let me tell you a joke. 
How's that? So I remember this when I was a kid. My dad had these LPs. Anybody remember LPs? 33 and a third. And so it was this comedian. And, of course, me having the sick form of humor that I did even then, you know, I'm going to remember those types of things. So this comedian's telling this joke. So, <clears throat> so there, there's one very, very wealthy guy, and uh, he was going to go across the country, so he got on an airplane, first time he'd ever been on one, and got up in the air there and uh, looks out over the wing, and the engine's on fire. And he realizes that uh, it's going to burn the wing off, and plane's going to crash. So he did something he'd never done before. He prayed. <laughs> so he says to the Lord, Lord, if you'll land this plane safely to the airport where I'm going to, I'll give you half of everything I own. He's a wealthy guy. So the plane leveled out perfectly, <laughs> comes to this smooth landing at the airport. He's coming off the plane. Here comes the preacher across the tarmac. <laughs> I heard what you said, son. I heard what you said. I heard you tell the Lord that if uh, he would land this plane safely, you'd give him half of everything you own, and I know you're going to start right now. The guy looked at him and said, no, sir. I made a better deal. <laughs> the preacher said, you did what? He said, yep, made a better deal. I told the Lord, if I ever get on another one, you can have it all. <laughs> Aren't you glad you don't have any money? <laughs> Can't make any deals. <laughs> All right, back to uh, the soberness. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's look at Genesis again, chapter 6. So we're seeing Cain put out, we're seeing Adam and Eve put out, put away from the presence of the Lord, really, though Adam and Eve, I believe, will come after the Lord. But they're put out of the garden, out of what was intended for them and where they were to live and where they were given, right, authority and command to take care of that garden. And because of their choice, they are put out of that. Now, Genesis chapter 6, we're continuing to look at the lost distinctiveness when mankind began to multiply on the earth. Daughters were born to them. I had two daughters and three sons. And, uh, you know, then when I have right now 16 grandbabies that are born and two more in the womb. The two more in the womb represent my continuing desire to spoil them rotten. <laughs> you know what grandparents do? <laughs> That's what we do best. <laughs> so... So anyway, uh, having sons and daughters are wonderful. I say to people all the time, when I grow up, I hope to be just like Josiah. Truth is, I don't know if I'll ever grow up. <laughs> I'm not talking physically, I'm talking mentally. <laughs> so sons and daughters were born to them, and the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wives. There's the soul in operation. No longer... Under the hand of God, they are doing what they choose to do. That is anathema to the sons of God. That godly line is kaput, to use a German term, with this action right here, that it has come to this. And it's sons of God, plural. That means it's not just one. In fact, I believe it becomes a majority. And you have the ones and twos by these men who are listed here in the scriptures. A pitifully small remnant who will stay true to God. When I talked last night, what had happened, what would have happened, what is the probability of what could have happened had they stayed true, they, plural, corporately stayed true. And the sons of, the son of God coming to the sons of God way sooner than after 4,000 years. So, <clears throat> but what I want to look at is this loss of, of distinctiveness as it comes to uniting ourselves to that which is forbidden. The line of Cain was forbidden. You are to stay away from them. You are not to intermarry with them. 
God sends them away and it has that meaning. Stay away. Do not intermarry with them lest you mix and become like them. And instead, there's a loss of distinction here in the, what we know to be marriage. The two become one. And when the two, the godly line, mixes with ungodliness and still calls it godly, we have a problem. And that loss of distinctiveness is another step towards the judgment of God upon the whole world. Can we see that? Can we see our times? Is it not clear to us that much of what's going on in the house of God and this loss of distinctiveness also includes, as certainly as it includes the independent spirit and independent action on our part, apart from God's will, God's mind, God's time, timing, God's purpose, we're acting. We are directing ourselves, leading ourselves, instructing ourselves, teaching ourselves, and that not in the will of God, but in the will of man. It is the soul and the will that is in the soul that is leading the way. That is a true condition, sad condition, of much of the people of God now, if they be the people of God. I'm not trying to make a presumption or an assumption either way. I'm simply saying what we're seeing is the independent spirit. We living for ourselves. God is something that we go do at church on Sundays. Not a relationship that is meaningful. God is put in his place and it's not preeminence. Or we are choosing to be independent. Here's what's the deal with Cain. We're choosing to be independent and say we're worshiping. Do you know that it's impossible to be a worshiper and be independent of God? Hello? It's an oxymoron. I'm a worshiper of God, but you live independent life. You're not a worshiper of God. You're a worshiper of yourself. You're bowing to your own will. You're bowing to your own desires. You're bowing to your own emotions, your own reasonings. That's life in the soul. True worshipers are not bowing to their own minds, their own wills, their own emotions. True worshipers, those things are bowing to God, and so are they. God is seeking true worshipers who bow to the Lord. And it's meaningful. And it's not some act. It's a life. Hello? So, there's this lost distinctiveness there and with Cain. There's this lost distinctiveness in the, uh, the two lines and now there's the lost distinctiveness, as is pointed out here, in what we are uniting ourselves to, what we are joining ourselves to, what we are giving ourselves wholeheartedly unto. Rather than the Lord, we are giving ourselves wholeheartedly to something else. And God's not fooled. You cannot, I cannot put God in a corner and keep him boxed in and say, well, God's got his way here, but 99.99% .99 of the rest of me is under my hand. So all of this, what we are wanting then is the exact opposite. We're wanting, as uh, 2 Chronicles 16 Reminds them, remember when you depended upon God? If that was ever true, it was said there in Second Chronicles 16. It must have been true at some point. When they were fighting battles, they were depending upon God. In just that one area, at least, they were depending upon God to be their victory, to be their victor. 
our forefathers depended upon God to uh, defeat the most powerful kingdom on the earth. Only 5% of the uh, colonists fought against Great Britain. 5%. But uh, there's a flag, right? Appealing to God, an appeal to heaven. Send us aid. Have you seen the flag? I have. Going all the way back to that time. Their trust was in the Almighty. They depended upon the Lord. It was true. How can this little group of colonists defeat the most powerful empire in the earth, the British Empire? By the Lord. <laughs> That's how. That's how it happened. The French helped, but even that was the Lord. They were all ready. You can see it. They should have been down for the count, and they wouldn't stay down. Their trust was in God. So, my dear friends, believers in the Lord, we want to be those who are dependent upon God and not independent. I'm asking right now, I'm asking the Lord to deal ruthlessly with the independent spirit that operates or desires to operate in me at all times. Not in times of my choosing. I mean to be wholeheartedly his. How about you? God, bring in Christ that work of the cross that separates me from independent life. It brings me to God dependency and into that right relationship with him to where I can address him because I can't, not in reality, address him as Lord if I'm still Lord of myself. It is a misnomer going on. Why, you call, why do you call me Lord, Jesus said, when you don't do the things I ask? Right? So to become dependent seems so weak in the church's eyes these days. But glorious in God's. There is nothing that God can't be through a vessel that is wholeheartedly his and that includes or is dependent upon God. Forget your plan B, and so will I. I'll stick with God in plan A. <laughs> right? The flesh, our own hearts and minds, devils, if they have an open door, you better have a plan B. God may not come through for you, then I'll die and go be with him. <laughs> right? Is that really that insane? Have you talked to the three Hebrew children lately? <laughs> Our God will deliver us, but if he doesn't, we're still not bowing. Get over yourself. <laughs> You're not God, and we know it. <laughs> Wait, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Is that the right way of saying it, brother? <laughs> you need to get over yourself, Nebuchadnezzar. You think you're everything. We think you're nothing. <laughs> so uh, the Lord bring to us that proper dependency upon him that includes obedience to him and his voice, right? A dependency that says this, I will not act out from myself. Christ never did. Christ never acted out from himself. You would not lure him to do so. He never would. He waited upon his father at all times and forever. And now in the church, we think that's impossible. You can't live like that. I know. Look at the condition of the church. <laughs> Because it refuses to live that way. 
But I disagree, don't you? I disagree. Christ in us, the Spirit of God in us, God the Father living in us, right? We will come, we will come and make our home inside of you. We are meant to live in such a manner. That's a part of the distinctiveness that God is after. They belong to me. They depend upon me. They do not act out from themselves, even when others are asking them to. Could you do this for me, brother? No. <laughs> Especially if you're asking me to come help you move. No, <laughs> totally kidding. <laughs> That's when you want dependence upon God. <laughs> or a back brace, what? <laughs> Sorry, that's sick humor, but I like it. <laughs> Dependence of, uh, dependency upon God is not conditional. It's not situational. It's not those type of ethics at all. Well, I think I can do this. That kind of thinking would never be in the mind of Christ, nor is it the mind of Christ in us. Well, isn't that what Paul said to the Corinthians? But you have the mind of Christ. I'm pretty sure in that translation in the Greek, that's not what that says. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's calling them to the mind of Christ. I've read Corinthians enough to know that nobody there had it. <laughs> don't you think? It's one of those translation errors, don't you believe? Yeah, it's a problem. But anyway, so dependency, dependency upon God, you're going to be, listen to me, Cain is going to kill Abel because Abel is dependent upon God. You are going to be criticized, at least. You're going to be mocked. You're going to be scoffed at if you, I'm not talking about of some kind of a fake spirituality, some super or pseudo spirituality. I'm talking about a real living relationship that presents Christ in the humility of us as life, and it's lived out, and it's consistent, and grows more and more to 100%. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And if that's not possible, then why did the apostle write it? And why is it given to us? It is completely possible. In fact, it is the will of God for I to no longer live, but Christ to be my life. And Christ will obey the Father every time as he always did. And we will become, you cannot be an obedient child without the obedient son as the life in you. Nor can I. Forget about trying to be obedient. You need a fuller measure of Christ, the obedient son. Terry, I'm really fighting disobedience. Well, focusing upon obedience isn't going to help you. Look to the Lord to be our life. Amen. Is that helpful? But that's true in everything. So what I'm saying is not impossible. It is completely the will of God for each and all of us. We have to hit this hard. We've been lied to, people. We have a salvation operating that's jerked yourself up by your shoelaces. How's that working for us? <laughs> <laughs> you need to be stronger. This is what the Lord told me years ago. I was like, oh, Lord, I'd failed the Lord. So I said to the Lord, I said, oh, Lord, I'm just so weak. He interrupts my sentence. I didn't even be able to finish it. Weak? You have never been weak. <laughs> he said, your problem is not weakness. Your problem is strength. You're so strong, I'm weak. Would that you would be weak so I could be strong. And I think I was glad when I could hear the Lord. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's going to look stupid. It's going to look, look weak to the world. It's going to look that way to the world of the church to become dependent upon God. To prove in the practical mundane of everyday life that God is our dependency, that he is dependable, and we're learning and learning and learning and growing to trust him. Did I hit that long enough? We could go on, but my heart in it, as I'm sharing it, is to 
enter in fully to it, my own heart, for God to have what he wants. It is easy in the church to be lured into disobedience without ever knowing it. We think of some great sin. I'm thinking right now of acting out of our own independent life choices. We're so used to it, aren't we? It takes a divine disruption to stop it, make us aware of it. Let our inheritance in Christ be dependency upon the Lord. Let our inheritance in Christ be made true worshipers, bowing to the Lord before I bow to my own will. Bowing to the Lord before I bow to my own way. Bowing to the Lord before I bow to my own desires. And go on and on and on. There's a true worshiper. Let the testimony of Jesus in us not be of lost distinctiveness, that there is an ungodly line and we are not part of it. Is that not the final testimony of Noah in the building of the ark? God has me building something to get out of this. I am not of it. I am not of the world. I am not of human nature. Human nature no longer will control me. I, in other words, I will not live naturally, but instead by the Spirit, life in the Spirit. I will not live in accordance to this world, and I will not live under the power of self and soul. I am not of it. There can be the testimony of the Lord Jesus in purity, in clarity, like a river that is crystal clear. Is that what we want, saints? Is that not what the world needs to see, though they may hate it or love it? That's their choice. But for the sake of his sacrifice, let them nevertheless see it. Christ in a people, in all purity, wholeheartedly, we're singing about it tonight, it's quite beautiful, wholeheartedly his. God finds in a vessel, as he did in Enoch, as he did in Seth's son, would begin to call upon the name of the Lord. As he would find in others, all the way to Noah, there is one who will maintain their heart, their will, and their mind for God. They will stay separate unto God. The distinctiveness will not be lost in life, in love, in purpose, nor in action. While God is putting out of the way, removing it from his sight, the whole world, and all its population, they will go through those waters unto resurrection ground. Well, so that's the ground they've chosen to be on. In Christ. And where God puts them at distance, like Cain, God draws us near and invites us, come to me. Noah is 100 years in the process, and God building the testimony of the Lord in a fuller and fuller and fuller way. Yes, the world has opportunity to see, but hear what I'm about to tell you. But that testimony is more built for God than the world. God wants him, and he wants you. First and foremost, you were created for him. 
Amen? Let's be clear. You were created. I was created by God, for God. I appreciate all that the Lord does through us, don't you? I really do. And uh, it is beautiful and necessary. But God could do all of it. And he could do it better. He could do it quicker and to much greater fullness. I want to ask you a question. God created the entire heavens and all that's in it in six days. There's the creative power of God. But there's something that captures God's heart and attention much more. How long has he been working in you? I guarantee it's longer than six days. You see where his focus is? You see where his love is? Is that not beautiful? Can we not just praise him for a second? Thank you, Jesus, that your eyes are not on what you can create. But thank you, Lord, that your eyes are on a vessel that will be yours. You created us for yourself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I believe that if we'll be that to him, there's nothing he can't be through us whenever he wants to be. And he'll be that in ever-increasing fullness through us in the midst of this world. Jeremiah preached his entire time and never one convert came to the Lord, not a single one. No one listened and no one responded to what they heard. What they listened to, well, I mean listen, I'm saying obeying it. No one did. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. It said so right in the scriptures. He preached even while he was building the ark. God's gonna get us out of here. We're not of this. It's going to rain. It's going to what? Rain. What's that? Because they didn't know. Nobody did. Because it never rained. Doesn't that sound foolish? Weak? Stupid? <laughs> I just want everybody to know, Noah's saying, we're not of this. I have no part in this. This environment I'm living in, I'm not of and what's true of me inwardly will become outwardly true of me as well. I will get out. He will take me out. For a hundred years, that was being testified to all that wanted to see it, even if they were just coming to mock at the building of a 450-foot-long ship. Some translations say it was bigger than that, but whatever it was, it was big. It wasn't a rowboat, that's for certain. <laughs> and uh, so what, when you're building something like that, people come, I mean, you can't even go down the road and there's an accident, then you're gonna have another accident because people are gazing over at the accident. I mean, people just love to stop and look, you know, and I'm one of them. <laughs> So people like going and seeing the stuff. That boat being built had to be hilarious to people. But see, there's the rhema of God to Noah and nobody else heard it but Noah because he was walking with God and because he was righteous like Abel. He heard what God said. He heard what the Spirit said. Don't we want to? And so um, Noah preaches. He preaches by life. He preaches by his actions. He preaches by his commitment. He preaches by faithfulness. He preaches by all of those things. It's life at work in front of everybody. He believes God. Abraham believed God later and it was credited to him as righteousness. And God made a covenant, the covenant of Christ with Abraham. The covenant of Christ was direct between God and Abraham. There was no intermediate, right? Right? The law was an intermediate. And, and thus there were angels in between God and man because of the law. But Abraham was under a covenant of Christ and there was no intermediate. It was God and it was Abraham. And we've been called to that covenant of Christ, have we not? And Abraham knew that. And he, too, went out 
Leave your family and get out of here. Curtis, he took his old man with him or his old man came and God wouldn't allow, allow him to continue till his old man died. What's that say to us? You can't continue till your old man's put away. That's what it says to us. There's no going into God. Well, that's a whole other message. But anyway, <laughs> Genesis is just full of it. Noah believes God. He believes what God says and acts accordingly. And the proof is in that of his actions. So he knew that the mixture of marriage, he knew that the independent spirit, he knew that the worship of self rather than God, he knew that this was going to bring the destruction of the world. I'm ending. Do we realize the time we're in then? that the independent spirit in the house of God, that the worship of self rather than the worship of God, I'm saying bowing to our own desires, our own wills, da, 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 da. Do we realize that this loss of distinction between the two lines, do we realize that this then going into marriage, into union, into oneness, with that that God has banished from his presence, will lead to the destruction of the entire world by fire. That's the days of Noah in our time. It is not a fantasy. It is the Bible. And also, it is the rhema of God. Both happening again. So, with every change of age, and Noah was about to see one, so was Moses. With every change of age, the rhema of God comes. You know what? It's the way it works. We must in our time not fail to see the testimony of Noah. I am not of this. I belong to him. And you're not going to be able to lure me to that which surrounds me. I will not be aligned to this environment. I will not have situational life to where I, just like the chameleon, become like that which surrounds me. Instead, we will be aligned to the eternal thought of God. I want us to stand for a moment, if that's your heart. We would be aligned to the eternal thought of God. His desire to have the human vessel fully possessed in the full measure of the life in Christ. Set apart, that means sanctified, to God's loving will as a vessel and to God alone. That is our statement. That is our declaration. That is our, is our prayer to you, Lord. As Drew was leading us in that prayer, in that song earlier. Second Chronicles 16, 9. Your eyes, even tonight, amongst us, roaming, scanning, looking. Right now, those in this room and beyond whose hearts are fully his or who are wholeheartedly the Lord's. We choose not, not to be of this world. We choose not to live by the fallen nature, by the natural. We choose Christ instead to be our life. We choose not to live under the yoke and slavery of self-purposed, independent life. In fact, we renounce all of it, as Noah did. And in building the ark, he renounced it every single day until God told them to enter the ark. 
He did not stop renouncing it until he entered the ark and the door was shut. We say before you tonight, Lord, we would be such a people as Noah was, a vessel made ready. Read, Lord, help us to remember and not forget the days of Noah as you are bringing them up to us in this time. Let us not forget the ramas that we have heard. Let not, Lord, the things of this life, the pressures of this life, the day-in, day-out dynamics of life steal and rob from us the voice of the Lord, the purpose of God in Christ, the eternal plan of God and why we were created in being yours. Let it not rob from us our day and our opportunity, but the, to be conformed inwardly to the image of Christ and that by the Holy Spirit. Let it not rob and steal from us that desire to press on to know the Lord, to know the Lord. As Paul declares in Philippians, I want to know him. I want to know him. Not having a righteousness of my own, according to the law. I want the right covenant. Abraham had the right covenant. Noah had the right covenant. It was between him and God. There was no need for a law in those people. There was no need for intermediary. I get it right in a, minute, in a moment. There was no need for that. There was no need for angels between them and God in a covenant of law. The covenant was Christ, and it was with God himself. It's that covenant we come into. Possess the reins of our very being from within and to without. Make us wholly yours, completely yours, possessed of the Lord, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people possessed of God. It's that people who will show forth the excellencies. And that, isn't that what we want? That he may be seen. Show forth the excellencies of him. opposite has resulted in the house of God in distance from God, being put away, relationally speaking, distance from God's eternal will and in his son. It has resulted in an absence of Christ's life within because of our choice to live independent life. The work of God, conformity to Christ. Christ being formed within, the renewing of the mind unto the, the mind of Christ, the glory of the Lord arising so that the glorious Lord is established within, all being missed, missed. Because in our time, the days of Noah and what surrounded him are surrounding us. And while in teaching and in proclamation, the lie again is being spread that it doesn't matter. I tell you, it matters. And it matters to God. So have your chosen vessel, Lord. Have what you want. I pray for this group of people. Those are here tonight, those are not here tonight. I pray for this group of people who we are glad and honored to stand with in the battle for this area. We are honored to stand with you. May God have the full purpose in his testimony, in life, in glory of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, in light, in truth, in way in and through you as a people here in this area. And wherever you're from, Alex from the Florida area, others are scattered from different places. 
there in Canada as well. We're asking for the full intent of God. We will not settle. We will not allow mixture. We will not unite ourselves. We will not intermarry with that which you have banished, which you have put away. We will not allow it to become united with us. But we will be instead united with Christ. One in life, one in heart, one in mind, one in purpose, one in intent. One, one, one with the Lord. It is that, Lord, tonight that we pray over this people as well as over my own heart and all of us. Now, uh, earlier in the meeting, I saw an angel walk past holding this flag, um, which this is not necessarily an important part. It just alerted me. Um, it had the cross on it. I recognized um, that type of angel representing the Lord's desire in this meeting tonight to heal, to be the healer that he is and heal. I don't want to be out of sync and out of time with God. I know you don't either. But I heard one specific thing. It's more than what I'm about to say, but I heard a specific thing. As the angel passed me, I heard this verse quoted. And I think the meaning of it is talking about the uh, joint that is put out is healed. I believe there are people here tonight that are having uh, joint issues, issues with your joints. And so if that's you, I want you just to put up your hand. If you're having joint issues and that thing's going out, Janet, John, okay. Yeah, numbers of you. I'm going to ask you just to come out to the center of the aisle here for a moment. You all mind doing that? Or you can come down front. Just come on down front. That's good. Um, we're going to lead you in the center's prayer. No. <laughs> Don't go ahead. Uh, first, you all have to lead me in it. Then I'll lead you in no. <laughs> So we're, again, I know this is not the full extent of what the Lord's wanting to do, but joint issues, I'm convinced the Lord wants to heal tonight. So in obedience to God, I hate these old patterns that are in the church. I'm not much on that stuff, but I'm a bit under orders of God in some of this to anoint with oil, lay hands on, and pray. Are you all okay with that? Yeah. This is the uh, a hidden essence that heals anything that Jesus misses. No, no, no. <laughs> Which would be nothing. <laughs> in other words, there's nothing in here. No, no, no. So Josiah and Isaac, can y'all uh, come and... Um, I don't really need the mic. You want that? <laughs> Sorry, Drew. <laughs> it's just a part. You want to say it, brother? No, no, I'm just going to change the battery. 